you will open your Bibles up to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Where is, there's June. Nate didn't make it. He's coming, okay. He's been working third shift and he's exhausted and I think, did he twerk his back? He did, okay. And uh, part, part of me wants you to call him to say stay home. And, uh, and Larry's right there, I saw June. Uh, see, see, you were pointing June out and threw her under the bus, and I threw you under the bus, Larry. So um, these are going to be our new these are going to be our new deacons. They have all served as deacons. Now, Nate, this will be his first time serving here, but he was a deacon at Mount Zion, and um, so we're, what we're doing this morning is we're taking Lord's Supper, but we're also uh, going to be commissioning these deacons in. Now, let me share some some little tidbits before we get started. John Wayne's funeral is going to be Wednesday, and it's going to be in Fredericksburg. Um, the funeral home will be having a viewing from 1 to 2 at Covenant. This is all online. Uh, it's on his obituary. However, if you look up John Wayne Henderson, put Virginia, because the Internet's full of them. And so that'll save you some time. And then graveside service is going to be at Oak Hill Cemetery at 2.30. Um, there'll be two pastors possibly doing the service. Um, John Wayne was very um, detailed in what he wanted. He just wanted a graveside service. Let me tell you, I had something a first happen ever in my ministry. Um, I got the call to go see John Wayne. It was, it was early in the morning. I got there maybe around 1.30 or so in the morning. And Irma was just um, devastated. As you would imagine, she was sitting on the floor numb, is her words. And we were sitting there on the floor, and we were trying to figure out, you know, the next steps and where we were going. We, we prayed, and we were just sharing about him. And um, John Wayne had taken notebook paper and had written out everything Irma needs to do with phone numbers, people to talk to, step by step for everything. She doesn't have to guess about anything. He took care of all the funeral arrangements, told her what he wanted. He had taken care of everything, had it all put together. And then at the end of those, and it was probably eight or nine pages worth of stuff. And he's got the most beautiful handwriting. He writes like a woman. It's incredible. Beautiful handwriting. And um, at the end of it was a little love note to his wife sweet man, good man. And now you know why Irma and him are so close. He's a good man. I did not say perfect man. If you know John, they'll tell you that too. But he was a good man. And so the graveside service will be 2.30. Uh, the reason I said possibly too is he wanted me and another pastor to do it, but I have surgery on Tuesday. It's not January unless the pastor has a surgery, right church? And um, so what I've got is there, there's a growth. They thought it was a blood clot. It's a, it's a growth right here. They think it's probably a fatty growth. That's what they're hoping. But apparently it's deep. And so they've got to put me under to do that. So if I can do it Tuesday, I will be helping with that service. I've already talked to the pastor. But if not, the other pastor will be doing his graveside uh, service. I had something else to share with you, and I cannot remember what it is, and I apologize. Um, that's what it was. I had uh, two people come to me today. What do we practice at this church? They practice Matthew 18. I wanted to kiss them right on the head. This is what they said. Why did you get rid of the choir? I don't know what you're talking about. Well, you got rid of it, right? Nope. Huh? So that told me something's been going around. Let me tell you what's going on. Pam, and we shared this a while back, Pam has stepped down from leading the choir, and we have a worship committee. And we as a worship committee, if you're on that worship committee, stand up. We've been talking since, what, November? We're talking about what, you can sit down, we're talking about what we're going to be doing as a church for worship. And they've gone to other churches and looked at other churches and see how they're doing it. Um, we are very traditional here. Amen or amen? We are very traditional here. 
Um, you see all the young people here packing this place out? Why are y'all laughing? Well, they sit up there. They don't sit down here. And so we've had young people come here to the church and say, hey, what do you think of the church? They like the church. And music wasn't even an issue. But what we're doing is as a committee, we are praying about, God, what do you want us to do? Would y'all be opposed to having somebody come and sing on a Sunday? I don't think so. Would y'all be opposed to having all the men come up here and sing one Sunday? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. Would it be all right if we had somebody come from outside and maybe lead the church and sing one Sunday? Y'all opposed to that? Are y'all opposed to having the choir sing? So y'all are all saying we're what? Open and flexible. What we're trying to do as a committee is pray about what does God really want us to do and be as a church. So don't worry, we're not going to have the ACDC band here next Sunday with fog machines. It's not going to happen. Uh, we're, we're not going to get rid of the choir. We are just trying to figure out what God wants us to do. So y'all can be praying for that committee, praying for us. But you know, this might be a good opportunity for us as a church to kind of look at ourselves and say, hey, maybe we can change up a little bit. Is that bad, church? No. And you know what we're also going to do, and I hate doing it this way, I just like springing along. We're probably going to do something special for Pam because she is, listen, she hasn't just led this choir, she has discipled the choir. And I think what the choir is more upset about isn't so much what's going to happen as much as we can't do this anymore, we can't go out and get ice cream, we can't do these things. <laughs> okay, so, so just be in prayer for that as we're getting ready to do some changes uh, in our church. Um, you know, when Pam came to me, my first thought was, oh no, and what are we going to do? And then God kind of laid on my heart, you know, well, that's not bad. We can figure it out. And so just pray for us. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to look at verse 23, and we're going to talk about the Lord's Supper today. Matter of fact, when many of us come to church, and we, we've all done a Lord's Supper, whether you're from a Methodist background or Baptist or Catholic, we all do this a little bit different. How many grew up in a Methodist church? Let me tell you, I grew up in a Methodist church and they had this special railing that went around the front. And when you had the Lord's Supper, you came down to the table and knelt down and took it there. And let me tell you, I miss that. I thought that was nice. When we went to the Baptist church, this was all new, getting served and bringing it to you and things like that. If you went to a Catholic church, how many of y'all went to Catholic church? Y'all did kind of like the Methodists, didn't you? You went up front and they, they served you there as you went forward. Um, but we really don't talk about it. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. We're going to talk about this, and we're going to tie it into what it is to be a deacon all at the same time, and be done by 12. Miracles will happen, church. Watch this. 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 23. Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and in this letter this is what he says. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. So he said, I've received instruction from the Lord, I'm passing it on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this, and whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Let's pray. Father, as we get ready for this new year and we have all these changes and things that are going on, I pray that you would help us to really make it a priority this year to draw closer to you. Your word says if we draw closer to you, you will draw closer to us. And so, Father, just help us to cultivate a heart that's devoted to you. Help us to make you a priority. Father, help us not to be distracted. Father, help us not to be discouraged by people in the church. But help us to draw closer to you. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What we're having this, this morning is what is called an ordinance. That's the fancy term. I'm going to teach you some theology today. I know, boring, and you're right, it's boring, but I want y'all smart. 
There's two ordinances in the church. One is the Lord's Supper, and the other, does anybody know what the other is? <laughs> baptism, thank you. The other is baptism. And, and Jesus, ordinance basically means prescribed. It means a prescribed practice. And so Jesus instituted this, and he told us how to do it and why to do it. Um, and churches all over the world, no matter what the denominations, if it's of the Christian faith, practice these two things. Now they may do it with different symbolism, with different meaning in different ways, whether you come forward and receive it or it's brought to you. But it's basically the Lord's Supper and baptism. Those are the two ordinances of the Christian church. So if somebody says, you know what the two ordinances are, you'd say what? The Lord's Supper and baptism. Now, our church, and every church is different. Some of, the, some of the, the, the worship team committee people went to Christian churches. They do the Lord's Supper when? Every Sunday. Every Sunday you're going to do the Lord's Supper. Baptist churches usually, not always, tend to do it the first Sunday of every month. And at our church what we do is who serves it? The deacons. And at this church, deacon role, and we're trying to follow the biblical model, is a servant body, not a leadership body. In some Baptist churches, deacons are the leadership. They tell the church what to do. They tell the pastor what to do. They tell everybody what to do. But that's not the way it is at our church. Their title at, at our church, deacon, um, really is just the word that means what? Servant, thank you. And it's, the deacons are the servants of the servants because we're all servants of who? Christ. And so the deacons will come and then they serve the, the communion, the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, the breaking of bread to you. Now, those terms are in your Bible and some churches will fight over how to use those terms. So I'm going to try to clear that up for you. Communion, what does that word mean? Well, it's easy, Pastor. It means the meal. No, it means fellowship. So when we're having communion, it's very interesting. Even in this chapter, Paul says when we're to take this meal, we're to do it together. Did y'all ever wonder why y'all wait and we all do it together? It's from the Bible. That's where we get it from. And it means to have fellowship. We're having fellowship together. We're doing something what? Together. And so the word communion, that's what it means, fellowship. It actually means fellowship or participation fellowship. Um, the Lord's table, that's actually found in 1 Corinthians 10.21. And Paul is talking about the Lord's Supper, and he refers to it as the Lord's Table. Now, let me tell you what Baptists have done. They think the Lord's Table means this. I had a fight over this in this church. Because, see, this table is holy and sacred because it's the Lord's Table. This is the Lord's Table, it sits on a table. But Baptist, and we're notorious for this, Baptist, we have made the table the Lord's table. And so if you're in church, in some Baptist churches, and you come and do this on the table, you have touched the Holy of Holies. That's not what this means. Paul is referring to the Lord's what? Supper. Well, where do we get that from? That's in your Bible too. Paul calls it the Lord's Supper because it was at a feast, at the Passover feast, that the Lord implements the Lord's Supper, and Paul refers to this as the Lord's, say it church, Supper. Gets confusing, doesn't it? Um, breaking of bread. We think of breaking the bread as a Baptist fellowship after church. Let's break bread together at Applebee's. But that's a term where Jesus says, this is my body and my blood, which has been broken. It said Jesus prayed and he broke the bread after he prayed. And there are some churches, different denominations, Baptist churches, and we do this at our churches, this is a memorial. We're doing this in what? Remember, in remembrance of him. There's some churches, especially if you come out of a Catholic background or Presbyterian other. This actually turns into the body of Christ and it actually turns into the blood of Christ. So you're actually eating the body and the blood. And they say, because Jesus said, this is my body and this is my blood, that's what this is. But let me give you an illustration to help you understand what Jesus is doing. He's using a metaphor. Uh, yesterday I saw some, we did a youth lock-in. And I'm 50 years old now. 
and I forgot how wonderful those lock-ins were. Isaiah, did you have a good time? Yes, sir. Y- yes he did. <laughs> and they all did. And there was one that stood up the whole time for 32 hours. Julianne got the award for that. But if the kids are all up, the chaperones have to be up. And so we're dog tired. And we were getting ready to go, and they got all the kids together and take a picture. And my man Isaiah had a Polaroid camera. A Polaroid, Dean! And it was, it was, it was new. I couldn't even figure out which way to hold it, you know, the button and all this stuff. I was trying to figure out how to hold it and took the picture for him. He got him up there and I took the picture for him. And this is what I wanted to do with it. I wanted to go, you know, remember that? (laughs) Shake it, shake it so it developed faster. And I said, well, I don't know. This is a new one. I don't want to mess anything up. And we sat there and the picture came in just like a Polaroid picture. Now, listen, if I had taken a picture of my wife with that Polaroid and I came up to Michelle and said, hey, look at your mama. Am I saying that picture's her mama? Or that picture's a image of her mama? So if I said, hey, this is my wife, and I pulled the picture out, I am not saying my wife is just an inch tall. <laughs> All right. When Jesus said, this is my body and this is my blood, he is not saying this is going to turn into it. Some people have interpreted to mean that. He's using it as a metaphor. It represents what? My body. And it represents my blood. And we're to do this in what? Remembrance. Remembrance. So that's why we as a church do this. We call it a memorial uh, Lord's Supper where we remember. Some of y'all have heard this term, Eucharist. Raise your hand if you know, if you ever heard that, okay? Some of y'all, a lot of hands, okay? Eucharist, does anybody know what that means? I know what it means, Larry. It means the Lord's Supper. No, it means to give thanks. That's what It's the Greek word to give thanks. And so as we come to this table, what we're doing is we're saying, thank you, Lord, that you did this for me on the cross. And we look back to what he did for us. And he did it, why? Because he loved us. We say, thank you, Lord, that you're my Savior and my helper and my keeper. And right now you're praying for me and you're there for me. And so we look back at the cross. We look up to what he's doing now. We also say, thank you, Lord, because if I confess my sins, you're faithful and just to forgive me because his, his blood has washed all my sins away and he's cleansed me from all unrighteousness. And so I look inward, so we're to examine ourselves too. I had somebody come to me, I won't say who it was, I had somebody come to me that I was very impressed with. They were worried about taking the Lord's Supper this morning and they had something happen in their life. And they said, they told me, they came and said, Larry, I'm not taking the Lord's Supper today. And I said, well, what happened? Well, let me tell you. And they vented for a little bit. And I said, that's called frustration. I said, that's not a sin. Because if it is, we're in trouble. Because there was times Jesus got frustrated. I said, now, if you had this little skirmish, if you will, and said, I wish they were dead. I hate their guts. Yeah, you might want to hold off from taking the Lord's Supper. Because your heart is what? Not right. Right. Part of the reason we come to Lord's Supper is because we examine ourselves and go, Lord, I'd forgive me for those murderous thoughts. Thank you that you died for them so I didn't have to. Thank you that you're working in me and overcoming me. And Father, thank you that you sent your son. And, and Jesus, thank you that you're coming back and that you're preparing a place. And so that's what the Eucharist means. It's, it's thanking God. And I examine myself and confess my sins and he's faithful and just to forgive me my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And so that's what the Eucharist. So the first Sunday of each month, the deacons will come and, and they will serve. And let me tell you why. Because this is, this is important to Jesus. And the people that should be taking this is Christians. Only Christians should be taking this because this is kind of like a family meal. And it's a time where Christians examine themselves and thank God for all He's done. And if you haven't experienced what Jesus has done for you, you can't thank Him because you haven't experienced it yet. And if you're not a Christian, you're not really fighting sin. It says you're actually a slave to sin, and so you're wrestling. So you can't really examine yourself and say, I'm going to repent. You don't even have the power to repent. So this meal is only for who? Christians. And the reason this is so important is because Jesus not only made an ordinance, but He loves us. And one of the very first things we are going to do when He makes everything right 
is we are all going to sit down together and he's going to have this meal with us. Now it's going to be a little bit different than this. It's probably going to be more like a Passover meal, but it's going to mean the same thing. And he says, I'm not going to take of this meal until we do this together as one big family together. So he's looking forward to this. Now in the Bible, in Corinthians, they were taking the meal a little bit differently. They were fighting to see who could get what first. Apparently they weren't a Baptist church because they were getting drunk off of it. So that means they were putting what in it? Wine. The Catholics went amen. They were putting wine in it and they were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper and they were fighting over it and there was us and... The, and they were having all kinds of problems. And this is, what the, this is what Paul said. The reason some of you are sick and even dying is because you're taking this meal wrong. This is a serious meal. It says that God will discipline you if you take this meal wrong. So that person that came and said, I don't know if I can take the Lord's Supper. You know what that told me? They take this very serious. And that's the way we should do that. And so we have the deacons come and they serve. And there's something that happened before Jesus did this meal. And this is where the lesson of the deacons come in. Before Jesus did any of the Lord's Supper, he did something. Um, Marcia's schools will give anybody $20 if they can answer what, uh, what he did first. I've only got 120. Only 120, so it's only one answer. All right, the one answer's first. I'm teasing. I'm teasing, she's not going to do it. What did he do before he served the Lord's Supper and said, do this in remembrance? They washed, he washed their feet. Before he did any of this, he unrobed himself, got down, and washed his feet. That would be the equivalent of today of toilet bowl cleaning with no gloves. That's how low that was. I've shared this with you all numerous times. That was the only thing a slave in Israel could say, I don't, I'm not doing that. And he didn't have to. And yet Jesus does. That's why Peter was having such a hard time. Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. And, and Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. Then Peter being Peter said, well, if that's the case, wash all of me. And, he, and I know Jesus must have just went, he said, all we need to do is just clean the feet, Peter. I'm, he's trying to teach him a lesson. And, and that lesson was on serving. It was on serving. Here's the first thing I want you to write down. And this is for all my deacons, but it's for the Christians here, because this applies to all of us, not just our deacons. The Lord's, was, the Lord's table was a declaration of what Jesus was going to do and wanted, but before that he comes to him and teaches a powerful lesson. And here's the lesson. If you're going to be a Christian, you have to look for opportunity to serve selflessly in humility. Let me read that again. If you're going to follow Christ, you're going to be a Christian. You need to look for opportunities to serve selflessly in humility. He was trying to help them embrace what it was going to be like to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, some people serve for self, and they do a good job of serving for self. Jesus preached about that. Be careful that you don't do your charitable deeds or your good works or righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward in heaven from your Father. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the street corners to be honored by men. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. See, some serve to be seen and to feel good about themselves. They're doing it just to feel good about themselves. <coughs> they, they give to the poor to, to be seen. They, they do things around here to be seen. They love to stand up and be seen. They have to be seen. And God says, that's okay. You notice he didn't condemn them? This is what he said. They got what they wanted. And that's all they're going to get. They won't get anything from my father. Nothing. Then there's ones that do things that go unnoticed forever. And God saw them do it. And God rewards them when they get to heaven. And they're going to be shocked. 
I really do believe this. Lord, you, you're rewarding me for that? You did it for my church. It was nothing. It was huge. Thank you. You stayed up for 32 hours with the youth? <laughs> See, now doing that, I just lost all my rewards. See, I'm bragging. You reward that? Yes, I do. The poo-poo diaper in the nursery? Yes, I reward that. But there's some that come out of the nursery. Woo! Big day today. 32 diapers, but I got it done. I got it all done. And God goes, they got their reward. They want everybody to know. Everybody knows. Jesus is teaching a very valuable lesson on selflessly serving with humility. Listen. Let me give you this too. Some serve so they can get. Some serve for self. Some serve for what they can get. I know people that take care of widows and do it well. So they can get in the will. They serve to get. I know people who uh, do favors for rich people. Really nice favors. Favors. So I can get. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. God notices those things. Deacons, you're never to do that. Matter of fact, it says if you're greedy for money, you shouldn't even be a deacon. You might be tempted. If you're elder, not do that. When we do our service, should we do it to be seen? You will never come to this church and see a bunch of people wearing sweatshirts saying Team Deacon. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Because Jesus is teaching a lesson, and he, he'd been teaching it to him over and over and over again, but he really wanted to drive the point home. Listen, let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, he created the universe. You're here because of Jesus Christ. You're wonderfully and fearfully made because Jesus Christ created you. Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Do we do that? Make ourselves no reputation. <coughs> Taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. That word bondservant is a, is a slave. It's a, it's, a, it's a, well, it's a slave. Let's use that word, bondservant. And coming in the likeness of man, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee should bow, those in heaven, and those on earth, and those under the earth, those who have passed away. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. See, God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. And because Christ humbled Himself so much, God exalted Him. Does that make sense, church? Let me share this with you. I'm trying to debate if I'm going to share this or not. I will. <laughs> there are people in church that are burden creators and blessing makers. Let me say it again. Burden creators and blessing makers. I was at the youth function last night and somebody came up here and said, can I talk to you? I just need 10 minutes. I need to talk to you. I said, sure. So we stepped out and we're talking. They said, we've got a problem. I said, okay, what's the problem? Talk to me. And they started sharing the problem with me. Some people made some phone calls to them and it was a problem. It was a, it was a serious problem. And they're sharing it and say, what should we do? And I said, well, I think this is probably what we need to do. And I agree with the problem. I see the problem. I know exactly what you're talking about. And as we're talking, they said, can I tell you how one of the phone calls went? I said, yeah, please. They said, when they called me, they told me what the problem was. And then they said this, I would like to help you fix this. Now, what they meant by that is I am willing to do whatever I need to help you help this, make it better. That's a blessing maker. Let me give you another example so you can understand. Let's say there is a, a stain out here on the carpet. It's a big grape juice stain. And Isaiah did it. 
All right? And um, some people come up, and this is a burden maker. I understand Isaiah spilt that grape juice last night. Was he supposed to be out in the breezeway? No. I thought you said they'll be locked in the social hall. They were. How did he get out there? Look, I don't know. Well, what are we going to do about this stain? You know it's going to cost $300 to get this stain. Is the church going to? Burden maker. It's a stain. It's a stain. You know, we had a really bad stain here one time, and nobody noticed. Because the person saw the problem, and they paid to get it fixed, and they didn't ask for reimbursable. Blessing maker. Churches are full of people who think their spiritual gift is fault-finding and criticizing. And they're going to be shocked because they're going to get to heaven and find out Jesus is going to tell them, that wasn't a gift. That was a burden maker. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Raise, raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Thank you. There you go. I just want to make sure I wasn't off my rocker there. There are burden makers and blessing makers. And listen, a, <laughs> I'll go there. I'm going to go there. We had so much trouble. Um, someone comes to you does this. There's a, we've got a problem. What's the problem? There's a toy in the toilet, okay? Well, somebody's got to get it out. Is it poo-poo in the toilet? No. Is it clean water in the toilet? Yeah. Reach in there and get it. Reach in there and get it. All right. That might make sense, church. All right. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. All right. Christ wants us, listen, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And when he washed the disciples' feet, this is what he said, I want you to do this. What I'm doing, I want you to do. Jesus is demonstrating, and listen, Jesus never asked us to do things he wouldn't do himself first. He did it first. He had a self-denying love. He wants us to lovingly care for others. No task was below him. No, nothing was too menial for him. There was no sacrifice that was too great for him. No cost that would cost too much for him. <laughs> Jesus wanted us to do that as servants. And he goes on to teach this over and over and over. Who wants to be greatest among you? Let him be a servant to all. And whoever exalts himself, they will be humbled but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Matthew 23, verses 11 and 12. Listen to this in Luke 22. Now there was a dispute among them of which one should be considered the greatest. The disciples are fighting. Who's the best? And Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But this will not be so among you. On the contrary, he who is the greatest among you let him be as a younger, and he who governs, let him serve. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Who's greater, the one ordering steak or the one bringing the steak? Who's the best? <coughs> Jesus said, it's the one who serves. And so a deacon and a Christian both should really be looking at what? Serving. Listen. Jesus says this. I'm going to read this verse later. He wants his joy to be complete in us. You show me an unhappy, miserable, bitter, angry person, and I'll show you a selfish person. But you show me somebody that's filled with joy and happiness, and I'll show you somebody that's serving. Amen or oh me. It is true whether you're in the church or out of the church. You show me an executive that is happy and charitable and loving, I'll show you a giver. You show me an executive as angry, bitter, and seeking, and a tyrant, I'll show you a selfish person. The only way Jesus' joy can be complete in you is if you're serving. That doesn't mean you're not going to be sad or struggle. doesn't mean you're, you're going to be unhappy. What I'm saying is, I'm going I'm to read it right off my paper. Those who love to cause drama and trauma are selfish people. They are. And so the first thing I want you to all hear, deacons, is it's it's an opportunity to serve selflessly in humility. 
The second lesson I believe Jesus was teaching before they came to the table is there's a difference between knowing truth and living it. Let me say that again. There's a difference between knowing truth and living it. There's a difference between hearing truth and knowing truth and living it out. I am amazed at the amount of knowledge people have about the things of God and, and, and have so very little impact in their families and in their communities and in the world. They know stuff I don't know. They can tell me the difference between Reformed theology and dispensationalism and be able to talk it all day long, but they've never led one person of Jesus Christ. I know people who can read the Greek New Testament, never led one person to Christ. Never. I'll say, Larry, I, that's kind of, no, I'm just telling you, we are really good about bringing in knowledge and knowing things and horrible about living it. So I'm going to give you a, a little test as we come to this table. Ready? Just say amen if you think this is good and true and biblical. We are called the reach to loss. Amen. Let's get a little Pentecost this morning. Amen. All right. Uh, we are to give our life for the kingdom of God. Okay? We are to, to invest our earthly treasures into the kingdom of heaven. All right? And God is going to store those treasures in heaven for us for eternity. All right? We are to have a unified body in the church. We are to be bold and courageous. We all believe that and we all know that. Now let me do it this way. We're to reach the lost and share the gospel with them. However, if you say uh, this, have you ever shared the gospel with anybody? Say amen. amen. A lot quieter. Let me ask you this one. We're going to do some examination this morning. Are we to give our life for the kingdom of God? We are unless it interrupts my life. I can't come to that because i got a ball game. Oh, I, I'd love to do that and come to the lock-in, but, you know, Just Us is on, and I've got to watch that TV show. It's the last one. It's the season finale. We know it, but we're not living it. Let me give you another one. Are we investing our earthly treasures? Okay. Um, are we storing our treasures in heaven? Let's use that. Um, when there's things that need to be done at this church, it's a lot easier to pay somebody to do it than to get some people to do it for free. Or if you've got skills, to offer your skills for free. Listen, God wants us to give those things. How many videos do I do for free? All of them. Could I make some money? Yeah. When I'm invested in what? Kingdom of God. My treasures, I'm hoping, will be all up there. The wood and the hay and the stubble, that's going to burn up and go away. But the things I invested for, for the kingdom of God, how long do I get to keep those, Dean? Forever. Listen, I'm going to step on toes. Some of y'all got beautiful cars and nice things, and you've invested a lot to have all that here, and I'm scared you're going to get to heaven with very little. Because it's been all about me. All right, I'll stop meddling. How about this one? Are we a unified body? Quiet. Are we a unified body? Amen. But however, when somebody's got a problem, we'll go tell everybody else. But we won't practice. Say it with me, church. Won't practice. Matthew 18. This is the new one I'm hearing all the time. It blows my mind. I got to come to you because they won't listen to me. <laughs> Have you been to them? No, they just won't listen. We laugh at that, but God calls that sin because this is what you just did. I don't have to obey God's word if the situation's right. Yeah, I know. We come to the Lord's table heavy today, aren't we? Be bold and courageous. Be bold and courageous. Are we as Christians to be bold and courageous, right? Y'all scared to answer now, aren't you? All right, if we're to be bold and courageous, does that mean to be bold and courageous and ask forgiveness? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's easier to say things with our lips than to live it with our lives. Amen or amen. amen. Listen, Jesus said, as the Father loved me and I love you, 
abide in my love, keep my commandments, and you will abide in my love. And just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Listen, we've got a whole world that's chasing happiness. Amen or oh me. If you don't think so, I cannot tell you how many spouses I've heard that said, our marriage has imploded because I'm just not, and it's their fault. The spouse's fault, by the way. It'd be like me saying this, and me and Beth just couldn't work out because I just ain't happy. You know what she'd say? I ain't happy either. (laughs) It's tough being married to you. All right, what we're looking for really is joy that only God can give us. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And do you know how to get joy? You get joy by serving. You get joy by serving. You get joy in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You get joy by being a blessing to other people. You get joy in giving to God. And then the the joy of the Lord is your strength. Listen, there is nothing that makes, you can ask my wife, you can ask my kids, you can ask anybody in this church. There is nothing in this world that makes me any happier than to help somebody. And when I help them and it makes a difference, I don't care. I could live in a tent. I am full of happy, say it with me, joy. God's wired me for that. But you know when I get really miserable? You can amen this too, honey, if you want. You know when I get really miserable? When I get selfish. When I'm thinking only about me. And I've noticed something. I can give to the Lord and give, and I can give to others and give. You can ask my wife this too. It kind of drives her crazy sometimes. And she does the same thing. She's wired the same way. Amen or oh me. She loves to help and she loves to give. If we won the lottery, we would lose all the money in three years. You know why? We'd give it all away. That's just how we are. And I drive her crazy because I love to what? And she drives me crazy because she loves to you doing what today? When are you getting back? How long is that? You taking them to chemo and then what? And then you're, what? Mm, okay. But she's full of what? And when I'm helping and serving and doing things, guess what I'm full of? Joy. But if I'm selfish, I'm a happy person, aren't I? No. My wife's never selfish. I'm selfish. And when I am selfish... I'm unhappy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And so as we serve, we have an opportunity to serve selflessly in humility as you're serving as deacons. And there's a difference between knowing the truth and living the truth. And Jesus wants us to serve Him and to identify with Him so that the world knows that we love Him. As we come to the table today, I want to share this last illustration, then we're going to have all our deacons come forward. And we're going to pray for y'all, and then you're going to serve, and you're going to serve, and June, you're going to serve. I had a young man come to me, and he's been seeing this girl for a long time. He loves her, and she loves him, and they really do love each other. For nine years, nine years, and they've been living together for nine years, and they said, "Uh, we want to get married. And this is what I said. I was so bad. Why? Why? He looked at me like, huh? I mean, you've been together for nine years. And they had some legitimate concerns there, but nine years. And so I said, "Um, okay. I said, can I ask you a question? I said, do you love her? He said, yes, I do love her. Then why don't you ask her to marry her back then? He was honest. He said, I didn't want to commit to her. He was, Alan, he told the truth. Usually come up with all, well, you know, I lose my benefits. And, you know, it's kind of hard when you live on your tax purposes, you know. And he was truthful. I didn't want to commit. I said, well, what makes you want to commit now? Because, Pastor, I want to live right. See, some of us love Jesus. We don't want to commit to Jesus. We want the blessings, but we don't want to have to take off our robe and wash feet. 
we want to be seen up here in the pulpit or in the choir or teaching a class, but we, want, we don't want to lay down our life for our wife. We want to be identified with a good name, whether it's Grace or Beale or Howerton's or Ephesus, but we don't want to live a life that reflects Christ. Because in all honesty, we don't want to what? Commit. Because I know if I commit to Christ, then I have to die and he has to live through me. It's easier to say we're a Christian with our lips than to live it with our life. So June, Larry, and Nate, I want to have you all come up here. Where's the rest of my deacons? There they come. And Nate and June and Larry, I'm just going to have you all stand. The rest of you all deacons, I want you to sit down next to them. I won't make you stand long. Is your back okay? All right. So if you're not Nate, June, or Larry, you're going to sit down. And we're going to pray for y'all. Y'all have already been, we call it ordained. They use that word. But we're going to just commission you today. And then we're going to serve. These are the new deacons. These are your deacon bodies here. And in your bulletin, there's some that aren't here. And I want you to begin praying for them. Y'all are going to be setting the example of serving. This is for all the deacons here, not just them. Y'all set the example for all serving. And y'all set the example of selflessly giving. And as you set the example, hopefully the servants of the servants, as they lead, the rest will what? Follow your example. And so we're going to pray for y'all, and then we're going to serve the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you that you're so patient with us. God, I'm thankful that you are gracious and your mercies are new every day. Thank you that your son, to teach us, took off his robe, girded himself up, and he washed feet. And it was so shocking, the disciples didn't even know what to do. Father, I pray for these three deacons that are standing that you would just continue to bless them as you have in the past. Father, Nate is serving first time here as a deacon. And so, Father, we're excited. The deacon body's excited. And Father, I'm sure he's a little nervous. But, Lord, I pray that as he follows the instruction of just serving selflessly in humility and living the truth, not just knowing it, that he will see you work through him. Fathers, we take this supper today. Can we examine ourselves and say, yeah, we believe certain things, but we're not living it, and just ask you to forgive us for that. And Father, forgive all of us for being so selfish. We're so self-centered. Father, I hate the times that I'm selfish. I hate it. And yet it seems to pop up so often. So Father, I pray that you forgive me and just help me to be like your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. I have my other deacon stand. And... <clears throat> deacons are already serving as deacons. Had somebody help pick that up and Robbie reminding me, don't forget Dean. And that's what deacons do. They serve. And then Larry's saying, look, you forgot me, Pastor. <laughs> and as we take this bread, it's a reminder that Christ uh, was broken for us. There's no greater love than this than a man lay down his life for his friend. I want you to think just for a second, who loves you the most in this world? You got it? They might even be in the afterlife right now. But the love they have for you looks like hate compared for the love that God has for you. And God loved you so much he sent his son to be broken and to die on a cross so that you did not have to die that death. So you could spend eternity with him. He loves you that much. And so as we take that, remember that and thank him for that and confess those sins that we gravitate to and just ask him to forgive us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you we thank you that you love us. You love us more than we could imagine. Father, you love our children more than we do. And so, Father, just forgive us for not making you priority in our life. Forgive us for not having you in the rightful place on the throne. Forgive us, Father, that we chase pleasures rather than you. 
And for God, Father, forgive us that we, we desire to be seen rather than to glorify you. Forgive us that we have to be right rather than righteous. Father, we thank you for your son, that he covered our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. You know what the great thing is about having somebody special in your life? You get to share life with them. And so when you hear something on the radio, you think of them. And if you're walking through a story, you go, oh man, I bet you they'd love to have that. And when you see a, read a book or watch a movie, you go, man, I can't wait to watch that with them. And some of the best times I've had with my bride has been sharing life together. And that's what God desires to do with you. To share his life with you, but for you to do life with him. So as you're going throughout the day, you're thinking of him, you hear something, you think of him. The problem is some of us have lost our first love and we don't think about him anymore. We think about me. And this cup is to remind you that Christ, even though he was above all, lowered himself to the bottom in order to share life with y'all. Because there is one that loves you enough to lay down his life for you. His name is Jesus Christ. And if you can understand that love, then you'll serve in love. And as you walk through the day, you'll be thinking of him. Let this cup be a reminder how much he loved you, that while you were a sinner, he died for you, and his blood covers all the selfishness and sins you've ever committed. And so as we take this and leave here today, let's think about that and keep that on our mind. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you that you loved us so much that you did send your son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save it. And that he was obedient all the way to the cross. And the one who created life and gave life became sin and died so that we could have life. He came that we may have eternal life. Father, I pray that as we leave here, we will think about the things of eternity. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said.